welcome everybody here. Uh, my name is Mike Elam. I'm the author of a book about Buford Pusser called Buford Pusser, The Other Story. With me is Dean Baldwin. Hello, Mike. I'm the author of the book, The Murder of Mrs. Buford Pusser by Oakley Dean Baldwin. You have to use my full name when you look it up. Believe it or not, there's actually another Oakley Baldwin as an author, and he does get some of my work. Okay. Uh, what we're here to discuss is uh, the murder of Pauline Pusser. Uh, and I would suggest up front that if you think you know the story about the walking tall sheriff, Buford Pusser, that you forget everything you think you know, start with the clean slate and do what Dean and I have done, and that is to uh, look at the evidence rather than the uh, story. Uh, I come from a law enforcement background. I was uh, a deputy sheriff in Benton County, Arkansas for several years. And then I got into uh, private sector and loss prevention with a major retailer. Uh, Dean has a similar experience. Go ahead, Dean. Yeah, I have uh, started out with the uh, West Virginia State Police and wound it up with the Wake County Sheriff's Office in Raleigh. I had a total of uh, combined part-time and full-time law enforcement of 34 years, plus uh, 30 years in the Coast Guard, four years active duty, and I retired as an intel officer, CWO4, with uh, Sector North Carolina. Dean, can you tell us how that you became interested in this story? Why that you became interested? Yes, Pauline is a distant cousin of mine. She was Pauline Mullins from Hayes Eye, Virginia. And my grandmother was Beulah May Mullins from the same area, from Hayes Eye, uh, Dickinson area of Virginia. So I'm a distant relative of hers. And it's always been fascinating to me um, that this murder has never been solved. And other family members also. Well, you know, uh, my interest came a little bit differently. I was in law enforcement when the movie Walking Tall originally came out. And of course, I was interested in that. I didn't believe everything I saw in the movie. I thought that it was probably uh, had a lot of fiction in it to uh, dramatize the thing. I didn't realize how much until I started researching the story and uh, found out that really very little of what we saw in the movie uh, was factual. Uh, you know, it's one of those things where you see a lot of falsehoods, uh, the state line that they showed in the movie didn't exist as it did in reality because uh, all those clubs were actually competitors. They didn't get together and work against Buford. Um, I learned that Buford was never beat up, cut up, robbed uh, like the movie showed. I know he did go back down to uh, the state line right after he married Pauline uh, along with two others, which the movie didn't show, and uh, robbed the uh, plantation club when only the owner was in there. There are so, so many fallacies about all this, including the ambush in which Pauline was killed. Well, since you brought up the plantation club, let's brief on that real quick. We, you know, he tells the story that he was beaten there over uh, cheated, being cheated over some uh, rolling of the dice game or card game and left out back for dead and had to be taken to a hospital. Um, and my take on that, in order for him to bring two men with him a week after he married Pauline from Chicago down to the border down there uh, to the plantation club. And then uh, there were several witnesses that said they were there. Um, there was a man and a woman testified that they saw all three men. Uh, of course, uh, W.O. testified that he saw all three men. And even his wife testified that those men, she saw them earlier in the night. They didn't just, whoever perpetrated that, this crime just didn't pop in and pop out. It They were there for hours. So a lot of, a lot of people saw them. I imagine they even talked to a lot of people. So, and I, I, I believe uh, the constable found one little laundry ticket from Chicago as part of his investigation uh, from that assault. Yeah, that was Cleveland Marler that found that. Uh, he was a constable that was in that area. He was also uh, a uh, court bailiff. And, uh, you know, he went there that morning. Uh, W.O. would tell that uh, everyone would, had left the uh, club. 
that he was uh, there by himself. Uh, Buford had bought a gun from him earlier in the uh, morning, and uh, he was trying to get him out of the, uh, uh, the place so he could close up. The jukebox was playing, and it was at the other end of uh, this dance hall part of the uh, establishment. And uh, Buford, uh, Jerry Wright, and Marvin King Jr. were all sitting in the bar. Well, W.O. goes in to unplug the uh, jukebox. When he turned around, he just saw Buford and Jerry Wright sitting there at the bar. But when he walked past this little, oh, approximately a four-foot pony wall that separated the bar and the uh, dance hall uh he was struck in the head with a blunt object and he would always uh tell that it couldn't have been buford that uh beat him like that because uh, uh he was looking at buford when he was struck so yeah. they they took a lot of uh cinematic and drama liberties when they shot that movie to make buford look like something that he really wasn't yeah and then we found out during that case that uh, I know his brother, John testified on his behalf. And so did Pauline, a couple others, but there was a 16 hour window that right. they could not testify um, to. And, you know, they were, they found them not guilty of the assault. So they dropped basically, then they knew they would probably not get a, any other type of conviction on them. Um, so they had to just drop the case, but um you know, in order for him to be arrested and this many people that actually testified against him, there had to been, in my mind, maybe there was something that he got cheated earlier because they said they had seen him in the club before, but it does speak of his character to drive that far. That's, that's a lot of revenge to want to do that, especially a week after you got married. Yeah. He had, uh, he and Wright claimed that, uh, did admit that they had been down to the area in the uh, area and visited the plantation club in October of uh, that same year. So uh, I don't know. I've always wondered if uh, you ever got married, needed a little money, you know, you uh, got a family now and uh, Christmas coming right up. And uh, since they'd been down there in October and they saw how well the place was doing, maybe they just decided that they wanted to go down and get a little money themselves. Well, he wasn't making a lot of money doing uh, wrestling and traveling with the circuit on wrestling no. and he worked at a little bagging cat, uh, factory and obviously probably minimum wage there and you know like I do back in the 60s minimum wage was what 75 80 cents a dollar you know an hour <laughs> this wasn't much to raise a family on that well, that'd sure. be interesting to check on to see exactly what kind of income he had back during those days but I wouldn't assume it could be very much right but, but uh at any rate, you know, it's one of those things where uh, uh, he's married. They moved to uh, Adamsville after Dwana is born. And uh, he worked several uh, different small jobs, wrestled a little bit. Uh, and then his uh, father was, Carl was chief of police in Adamsville. And he'd been injured in a uh, car wreck of some time before had a hip problem. So he resigned and uh, after he managed to get Buford uh, named as the person that would take his place as chief of police. And then we know shortly after that, he ran for constable in the third district third and district. won. That's right. So that, that kind of gave him the uh, olive branch to reach out past the city limits to um, start with his moonshining uh, um you know, moon, moon shining or steel busting activities. Yeah, I think that was one of those cases where uh, I've, I've interviewed a lot of the people from back in those days. Uh, the majority of them have passed now, but they would tell me that uh, if you didn't pay Buford, uh, he would bust up your steel. Uh, same thing with club owners. He always had the threat that he would uh, shut them down if they didn't pay him. Uh, just about every one of them I talked to and interviewed said that, you know, uh, they had to pay. Uh, the method always seemed pretty much the same. And the movie didn't show anything like that. Uh, you know, it was just a, a, a terribly different story that we saw. Also, I know that uh, he had multiple affairs uh, while he was married. And uh, 
that had to be difficult for Pauline to deal with. I would imagine. Um, I don't know how much you knew about the affairs because I know the family members were not aware of any type of domestic uh, situation between them. Um, you know, I've talked to several brothers, first cousins, and they all pretty much had a good opinion of Sheriff uh, Pusser. But, you know, like I know that if you're not in the household, you're not the adult in the group, even sometimes your kids don't even know what's going on and you could, they're in the same household. Right. So, and, and these always, people were uh, in uh, Louisville, Kentucky and Hayside, Virginia. So they weren't right there where that they would see and hear what was going on. That's correct. And that's why it's so important to talk to all of the witnesses, even some of the witnesses that weren't interviewed during the 1967 investigation and, and coming up with, um, you know, you have to follow all leads, even circumstantial leads. Obviously, we want clear, and concise, and concrete evidence and all those things. But sometimes your preponderance of the evidence, like in a civil case, you only have to reach that 51% margin to, li to lift the scale up in your favor. Well, you don't just totally disregard that evidence. You actually have to check that evidence out and, and get to the bottom and see if that's actually um worthy to be uh, categorized as clear or concrete evidence and versus uh, hearsay or um, right. or circumstantial evidence. You know, I, I do know of uh, several women that he was seeing. I interviewed some uh, others. I didn't get the opportunity. Uh, some are still around uh, amazingly. And, uh, you know, I think, uh, one of the story goes, and it's been difficult to uh, verify, but two women were at the uh, Old Hickory Club, Old Hickory Grill that Junior Smith owned, and they allegedly overheard uh, the Pussers in an argument just before the uh, ambush in which uh, Pauline was letting Buford know that she was tired of uh, his womanizing. He, she was aware of his corruption, and... Uh, you know, uh, that if it didn't stop, uh, she was going to report what was going on. And allegedly he said that, uh, if she did that, she wouldn't live to see the light of day. Mm. Yeah, that's, that, that goes back to character again. And we do have a lot of examples that are, uh, questionable with his character on, a, on a lot of the, uh, calls that he handled. And I don't know how many we can get into during this program but we could probably go on for hours on yeah. se separate uh, uh, re reports and se separate um, calls that he actually responded to. And uh, once again, there's no eyewitnesses. Yes. Uh, you know, it's kind of like, uh, you know, he was alleged to have been shot eight times, stabbed seven times. And when you get down to the character of, of, of those situations, like you say, never any witnesses. Uh, the only time that I could find anybody that witnessed any of these things was uh, when he was at a uh, house fire where the, there were fatalities. And, you know, he was controlling uh, traffic. Ward Moore, the county coroner, was there. And when I interviewed Ward, he told me about uh, Buford stopping this vehicle because he thought it was carrying moonshine. And that the guy tried to take off and he said, Buford did hop on the hood and reached in, tried to get the steering wheel and that, uh, you know, he was being hit with a wrench, but Buford would claim that he was stabbed during that. And Ward would say, I saw the whole thing. It, that didn't happen. And, uh, but then you get to looking at all the shootings, all the stabbings, they're all similar, no witnesses. You know, you just had to take his word for it. Now, you get back to taking his word for something. You know, you got to remember back in those days, the sheriff was the, the public affairs officer and he handled the media. You didn't have a separate office or a uh, person with high integrity that, that was trustworthy, that the reporters would take their word on everything that they said. And even the reporting back then, uh, they did think most sheriffs walked on water. And they did take their word. They didn't dig into a story and do what we call now investigative reporting. 
Right. And, you know, uh, I did interview uh, a radio host, Bill Way, that was actually there the day of the ambush. I uh, went down to the state line with uh, uh, TBI's Warren Jones, took a lot of the photographs that, uh, you know, we have today. At any rate, uh, one time, you know, Way tried to ask him, uh, Buford, about an incident that he was involved in where he allegedly abused uh, somebody that uh, he had made a traffic stop with. And, uh, you know, you talk about uh, Buford being his own public relations person. As soon as Way started asking him about it, he started to bully and intimidate uh, Bill. And, you know, Bill was young then and Buford was huge. And he said he was intimidated. You know, he wasn't sure what Buford was going to do. And that's an odd way for a, a public official to act. Well, he was trained as a professional wrestler. So we all have to keep in mind that boasting and bragging and, and, and setting the bar higher than uh, expectations when it, can, when it comes to your actions versus what really happened are normally two different things. I and mean, he trained that way. A lot of the uh, scenarios that were told, like that gentleman told, um, that he was beat with a wrench, but he wasn't stabbed. But yet it still got told that he, he got stabbed because he, he knows he's he's running for re-election and that would definitely help maybe the coffers and people to uh, give him a little uh, extra consideration on a vote. But look what he's doing out here for us. Yeah, absolutely. You know, back to the ambush, uh, I've always found it strange that after he made... Uh, the threats that he did uh, toward Pauline, that later he was seen uh, at Eastview getting guns from an individual uh, in a, uh, I think it was a Chevy Biscayne uh, that had Oklahoma tags. And two boys, uh, Dennis Hathcock and Johnny Harrison, witnessed uh, this gun exchange that took place at Eastview. And this is just prior to the ambush. And uh, I don't know that that was ever really investigated well. Yeah, I've not heard much about that myself. Um, there, and there are several uh, uh, different stories being told uh, from different sides of the family. Obviously, I, I looked at my book from Pauline's side, being a Mullins. And, um, you know, her story really hasn't gotten told and it won't be until we get justice for Pauline, like you've reached out for and I've reached out for. And we both want what the truth is going to hold, not what the movies have shown or what other people are saying. We want to get down to the truth. There's a lot of things. One thing, finding the Plymouth Fury. I mean, first of all, that car should have never gotten away. Not talking bad about our brothers. It was different back then on how they handled evidence. Right. But locking that up in a secured uh, place until this case was totally solved or until uh, they exonerated uh, everybody, everybody who, who the rumors were going around about. Um, if that car could be found today, you, you could still knock the paint off of it, dig the pondo out of the bullet holes and actually come up with uh, some forensics from the vehicle. Sure. To trajectories. Exactly. You know, that, no that brings us up to the, uh, well, first of all, uh, you know, I found, uh, LaVon Plunk who was, uh, Pauline's best friend claimed that she was with her just prior to the ambush. Uh, she had taken her home and, uh, you know, said that Buford came home shortly thereafter. She had parked down the street a little ways because, she didn't like being around Buford and she was afraid that he would come home. She said that she heard a gunshot uh, come from the residence. She left because she didn't know what to do. Knew if she called the uh, sheriff's office, it would be Carl Pesser that would answer the phone. She couldn't call her husband, uh, Petey, because he was one of Buford's most trusted deputies. Uh, and I learned that the uh, TBI never uh, interviewed her. And like you said, that's one of the things you do is interview uh, uh, friends and family. And, uh, you know, when I interviewed her, I had a recording that I'd gone ahead and submitted to the TBI. Uh, the route they took that morning uh, seemed strange. Uh, 
it took a lot of back roads and everything. The calls that came in saying that there was a disturbance at Hollis Jordan's place on 45 near the state line. And they take all these back roads to uh, uh, get down to New Hope Road rather than just get on 64 and 45 because Buford had a reputation of wanting to drive fast. Yeah. And I've always wondered why he didn't just get on that uh, uh, highway and yeah. open it up rather than take those back roads where you'd have to go so much slower. There's a lot of questions on that crime scene. And um, until we get in, until we can get a little more information, um, it, it, the, the timings, uh, right. you know, how, many ti how many times did Pauline actually ride with him? And I've heard a couple, I think you heard, that he never did from a Moffat for, from a, one of the other deputies. Right. And she never, she never rode with him. That's correct. Um, so there's, there are some um, conflicting stories uh, sort of like when I interviewed Diane's daughter, um, you know, she told me that she had never heard her mother say that, but that doesn't mean it wasn't said. It just means that she didn't say it to her. Yeah. So, and since I didn't get to do her, you know, I have to, I have to weigh the evidence that I'm receiving also sort of like with, when I talked to Pauline's brother, Clayton and Pauline's brother, Griffon, they were both actually together that morning waiting for uh, Buford and Pauline to arrive for their family get together. So, you know, when I hear that there was a suitcase packed at the door, you know, that really doesn't, um, worry me maybe as much as having um, uh, Pauline with other injuries or having, having um, you know, from an autopsy report or having even having a sheriff, uh, his autopsy report or having, you know, how many teeth were knocked out of his mouth? He was shot um, in January of 67. There's a famous picture of Pauline sitting with him with a Band-Aid on his left cheek. And that's, you know, eight months later, he gets shot again in the same cheek area. They say, some say two rounds with a high-powered rifle. I well, don't buy that. <laughs> well, my question is, um, you know, he's grabbed, he stated he grabbed the barrel of the rifle, you know, and that may have been some deflection for a gunpowder residue test or why it wasn't done. Um, you never know what someone's thinking when they're getting these questions. So my question is, um, you know, why did they take the route they took? Does the crime scene match with what he said? No, it won't match 100% because as you and I know, we're under a lot of stress. You're going to get some of the facts wrong. But if you can't make it happen in a recreation and you try it in several different ways, you try it at night, you try it at daylight, you try it at different speeds, and you still can't get it to fit the narrative, then that's thanks to high heaven. Something's not right. Yeah, that's that's exactly what uh, uh, some of my associates and I did. We got out there with two cars, tried to reconstruct the uh, uh, the ambush. And the thing was that uh, whenever I was driving the car that would represent Buford's vehicle, and uh, we would drive at a pretty moderate speed, not real fast, but uh, certainly faster than most people would. And uh, by the time I reached that first ambush site, the uh, ambush car was just coming into view in my rearview mirror. And Buford said that they uh, pulled up alongside him at that bridge, turned their headlights on. Now, keep in mind that that ambush was supposed to have happened at 445 in the morning. So it's seven tenths of a mile from the church where they think that the ambush party started following him down to that bridge. And I want to know how they did that with no headlights at even a moderate speed. Just doesn't, just never, we couldn't get it to work. Uh, you know, he uh, changed his story about where the ambush uh, or where the uh, call was that they were responding to. Uh, that raised a lot of red flags. But, you know, like uh, you, what really bothered me was... Uh, uh, a couple of years earlier, they could do an autopsy on Louise Hathcock, in which they found out that she was shot in the back twice. But then they couldn't do one on Pauline. I, I've, I've never got to where I could understand that. 
Dean, the clock on the wall tells us it's time to end this episode of uh, Buford Pusser, the other story. Uh, unfortunately, we've run out of time, but I would encourage everybody that's uh, watching to order Dean's book, The Murder of Mrs. Buford Pusser. Uh, it's available at Amazon.com, also at uh, Barnes and Nobles. Uh, it tells a lot about Pauline's life, how she grew up, uh, where she was from, how she met Buford, and unfortunately about uh, the August 12th ambush in which she was killed. Uh, I, on the other hand, I might have mentioned that uh, Dean intends to write an entirely new chapter to add to his current book, uh, explaining uh, a lot of things about the uh, ambush, whereas I intend to uh, write an entirely new book to go along with my current one. Uh, my current one is Buford Pusser, The Other Story, which tells a very different tale than what Walking Tall did. Uh, the movie Walking Tall was basically uh, a fictional account of Buford's law enforcement career, uh, whereas my book is based on uh, facts and information that I've gained from interviewing a lot of people who were there and lived the, the real story along with Buford. Uh, my new book will be basically about the ambush, a lot of information that uh, was not available in 1967 when they did the initial investigation. Uh, just uh, lots of good things that I think there's enough information we have now to actually bring this case uh, to a close. So uh, I would encourage everybody to look for it when it comes out. At any rate, we'll end today. We'll do another segment, uh, share more information about Pauline, uh, about uh, the ambush and about her death. So uh, be sure and look for that and join us when it comes out. Thanks and have a good day.